my name is Mushtari Afros and I would call myself um, a Kathak dancer um, and I most of my performances are in Toronto but I don't live in Toronto I live in Pickering mm. um, and uh, Kathak is uh, one of the eight major classical dance forms from India um, it's it, uh, it has its origin in the north um, and uh, it shares the same root with flamenco dance, mm -hmm. uh, which is what we incorporated in our project with, that we presented at Virtuality. Definitely. Yeah. Great. So we'll return to that in just a moment, because I want to first ask you, um, what inspired you to pursue your practice in Catholic dancing? What led up to that? Um, actually, when I was a child, uh, my family was... Uh, interested in music i mean if you go to south asia almost every one in three families will have mm -hmm. uh, a musician or a dancer or a vocalist in the family so especially in in bengali families so i'm from bangladesh mm -hmm. um it, especially in bengali families it has always been a practice like they would force their kids to do something as, as an extracurricular activities so i started taking folk dance classes um, in school. Um, in Bangladesh, classical dances are not necessarily, um, uh, when I was growing up, it wasn't necessarily a big deal, uh, the classical dance forms. Uh, folk dance is, is heavy, the dance, folk dance and music is heavy on, uh, in Bangladesh. So mm -hmm. I was introduced to Bengali folk dances in school and I continued that as part of my school's extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. and, I, and when I traveled to, so the dance kind of was with me always. However, I would mention that because I'm from a Muslim background, um, dance was probably the last thing in parents' mind compared to the other art forms. Mm -hmm. So they would like me to take up, um, you know, either art or poetry recitation or music mm -hmm. over dance. Interesting. <laughs> so dance is not necessarily um, accept, what was not a, a very welcoming art form mm -hmm. uh, because apparently in Islamic culture, um, dance is uh, is, is, is an art form that is not well respected. Oh. That's how it's seen, but I don't personally believe it. So it's, it's not, I wouldn't say my parents were against it, but it was just the social situation was like mm. that. So if your kid is learning dance, yes, learn it when you're a kid, but when they're growing up, like, you know, when they reach their teenage life and if they're still continuing dance as a profession, um, then the parents would hear things from the social communities. Mm. So it was, I would say that really worked against um, my progression, um, you know, as a professional form at that level. Mm. But when I immigrated to Canada with my parents, they were like, you know, this is, I mean, there's no harm in, in pursuing dance. So I started taking kata classes uh, my first guru was um, Joanna D'Souza from mm -hmm. Toronto, uh, sorry, Endo Kapek. Um, it used to be part of Toronto Tabla Ensemble. Um, I continued with her for about two years on and off. And then I was introduced to um, my, my second guru, which I would say actually a lot of the contributions are from her, the, the way I dance now. Mm -hmm. um, her name is Savita Sharma, and she is primarily an Ottawa-based Kathak dancer, but she was um, a disciple of uh, Pandit Biju Maharaj, so he's like a living legend of Kathak dance mm -hmm. in, uh, in Delhi, India. Uh, so she studied under him for about 15 years mm -hmm. in Delhi. Um, so that's Lucknow, so she studied Lucknow style of Kathak. So the three main styles of Kathak, Lucknow, Jaipur, and Banaras. Mm -hmm. um, so after I studied with her for about, I have to say, nine years, then I started exploring Jaipur's style of Kathak as well, which is with, again, um, he is also based in Toronto, and they have a school called Panwar School of Music and Dance. So I studied both Lucknow and Jaipur style of Kathak. And I mean, I will continue learning it. It's an Indian classical music and dance. We never stop 
learning right. with our teachers or mm -hmm. gurus. The, there's a difference between guru and teachers, but I won't get into that conversation too much. Um, so we continue learning. So mm -hmm. there's no stopping, like, you know, you finish your school and you're over. Right. There's no such thing. We continue our professional performances, but at the same time, we also learn um, with them as long as they're alive, I guess. Mm, that's awesome. Um, so, yeah. So I would say this would be like at least from early 2000 till now. Mm -hmm. That's my journey in Qatar. And before that, it was Bengali folk dance. Amazing. Um, it's really interesting how performance and dance, mm -hmm. their travel, they travel around the world through the body. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a really fascinating thing. I also want to ask you, um, because you studied something that might be stereotypically different or mm -hmm. considered different from dance, which is physics, I believe. Um, yes. But we spoke in a previous conversation how um, being someone that practices both, you were able to see the similarities in them. Could you talk a little bit about that? With yes, me? Um, before that I would mention actually Kathak is a very unique dance form from India uh, in the sense that it has influences from both Hindu and Islamic culture. Mm. So although, so uh, when I was growing up, I was not encouraged to dance because I was growing up in an Islamic family. But mm. if you look at the history of Kathak, Islamic contributions is is uh, almost like you can't avoid the Islamic con contributions in Kathak. Actually, the current form of Kathak probably utilizes more of the Islamic abstract concepts mm. as opposed to a very literal concepts that comes from the um, Hindu cultures. Mm. Um, Islamic culture, we don't necessarily talk about um, like, you know, there is no visual form of God or goddesses. There is no such thing. If you look at the Hindu side of it, there is more of that. Mm -hmm. um, coming back to your question, um, so this is a very common practice in South Asian families that you can do dance, you can do other art, but you have to study, you have to make a profession out of something that is more considered more valuable mm -hmm. to the society. So yes, um, I studied physics, but it wasn't, I wouldn't say that anybody forced me to study physics. It was something that I fell in love with when I was in my junior high school. Mm -hmm. um, the first, um, the fir I would say the first incident of falling in love with physics was that I could draw how a car is moving on a graph. So it was like, oh, a car is moving, but I can, I can, um, I can draw its pattern in with my pencil on a graph paper. So that was something very fascinating. Mm. And as I studied more and more, um, and I also worked at Fermi National Accelerator Lab in Chicago, um, and it was on particle physics. Um, I just realized that it's it the the brain. The, the knowledge and the way of thinking that it has given me this the the mathematical or pure science I can easily transfer that knowledge in my artistic work um, artistic work and some we have we have a perception and I think it's the wrong perception that arts and science are in go in two different directions but I don't necessarily see it mm. science to me creates the foundation even when we you are moving in dance you have to be efficient of your movement that efficiency is a very to me is a very scientific way of looking at things mm -hmm. um, and how you beautify stuffs on top of that um, technical movements that comes from your artistic understanding so I feel that there's no difference Instead, I mean, as opposed to that, it's actually, it's actually helping me to take my, to combine my arts and science to take it a bit further mm. uh, compared to compared to other artists who um, who are uh, who who might be in a in in a position where they think that science and arts are going in complete opposite directions. Mm. That's really interesting to see the parallel in your practice bringing science and art together. It's similarly to the way that it brings flamenco and Catholic back mm -hmm. together. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really beautiful how that translates. Um, 
I'm curious as well about what your art making process typically looks like when you're coming up with a choreography for performance, coming up with a story, how, how does that all um, come together for you in your process? So I think there are two, I would say two major, um, major, uh, major processes. Mm -hmm. One is if I'm applying to um, a festival or if I'm applying to uh, uh, a set programming, so for example, Project 40 had something in their mind, so they, they um, asked for submission from artists. So they have a concept in mind. Sometimes my processes could, could, can be completely geared towards that. So I, if I look at the concept, then I think about the concept and then I go in the, in the creation process. Mm. The major, I would say 90% of it would be diff, a, a, a different approach, whereas Everyday life, I'm experiencing something, I'm talking to say a stranger and they give me some ideas to think about. So the concepts and ideas would be generated through that. Mm -hmm. And I will park that and say, okay, so this is the first thing that, this is the first concept that I really want to work on right now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I would say 90% of it is very random thought processes or might be, I might be reading something mm -hmm. or I might have seen something, a current situations. Like for example, a few, few weeks ago, there was a, um, there was a huge political uh, situations in Bangladesh. So that gave me some ideas to create a new work. Mm -hmm. um, so th those are very random thought process, but that's my 90% of a powerhouse mm -hmm. of creations. The, the other 10% is, if there's a festival, they have a something concept in mind. If I like the idea, then I'll create a work mm. towards it. Um, so I guess maybe a good set. This is a good segue to specifically talk about resist coexist. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious about uh, you know what came first, the story or the idea, or meeting with Tamar, or um, how did how did the piece come to fruition? Um, it's very interesting. Um, so. Resist Coexist was uh, first produced by emerging young artists um, and uh, the person who is who spearheaded that idea um, was um, Clara Wang um, from emerging young artists I believe she's the vice president um, so she approached both me and Tamar without knowing that Katak and Flamenco share the same route. Oh, wow. She actually came to learn about it from with conversations uh, with us. And um, so she, uh, she uh, met with us and in several meetings and she explained to us the idea of their exhibition, which was attachment, detachment. Um, and then uh, so the conversation went like, do you want us to do uh, a performance? Like, you know, is it going to be just me and Tamar showing Katak and Flamenco just uh, in a literal sense? Mm -hmm. Create uh, music and just present a work. She was not uh, in favor of it. So she said, no, we, I want to create something that, um, that will talk, uh, that will address the theme of that exhibition. So Tamar and I, we put our heads together and then we created um, Resist Coexist out of it. So I would say the, uh, the, story, the story came up after we saw the theme of the exhibition. Mm. Interesting. And it was just a very interesting um, situation that Katak and Flamenco were under the same roof for that project. Absolutely. Yeah. I want to get into that a little more in a bit, but first I want to ask you about how collaborating might have changed your process if you were working on this project alone versus working with someone who is not only a dancer, but a dancer from another um, dance practice. How did that kind of cross-cultural collaboration change the way that you normally um, work on uh, a choreography? Hmm. Um... That's very interesting. Um, so Tamar comes from uh, a flamenco background. Uh, she's also a vocalist. Mm. Um, I'm not a vocalist, I can't sing. Um, however, 
One thing that was that is very common between Kathak and flamenco is the rhythmic understanding. Uh, rhythm is very important in in our dance forms, uh, both uh, flamenco and Kathak. So although structurally it's slightly different, for example, they emphasize on the last beat of any uh, rhythmic cycle, we emphasize on the first beat mm -hmm. of the rhythmic cycle. However, the strength of understanding of rhythm were both in us. So we had, so that was our common language of communication. Mm -hmm. um, however, um, it, I have seen flamenco dance before on stage, but it was the first time that I experienced working with a flamenco dancer. So I understood how, where the limitations are, where they are more flexible, where my limitations are, where I am more flexible in, in collaborations. Mm. Um, how far she wants to stretch the story, how far I want to stretch. And also depending on the budget constraints, where we should stop. Um, so cross-culturally, even from a co costume point of view, right? How do we make the how do we make the costumes um, in a way that it doesn't it doesn't look too too ethnic um, mm. but at the same time it it communicates the cultural background and the concept mm. um, that we are trying to communicate mm. um, so those um, I would say those are the things that um, I learned from a collaborations um, from a very different culture. Mm, that's really fascinating. Um, I want to get a little bit into more about the relationship between Kathak and flamenco. You mentioned that one emphasizes on the first beat, whereas one emphasizes on the last. How did those, like I guess, difference of like beat and mathematics change? Uh, did it limit how you were able to? to move as a Catholic dancer or her as a flamenco dancer or did it like fit well together in that sense? Um, I think I, I wouldn't say it limit us but it's probably improved our understanding mm -hmm. of the two different rhythmic structures. Right. Uh, we both knew that they share the same root. However, we never experienced it hand, like you know firsthand how they are different musically or rhythmically. Mm. So it was a first-hand experience. Um, we didn't change any of the musical structure, rather we tried to fit in within the musical structure. So if Tamar is giving me a rhythm, I had to think about how I can incorporate my movement vocabularies in it mm. um, and vice versa. Um, since we're on the topic of rhythm, I want to talk a little bit about Ahilan's role in mm -hmm. it as a drummer. Um, so you and Ahilan have a long working relationship, is yes. my understanding. How does that relationship between yourself as a Catholic dancer and your drummer change with having a flamenco dancer also in the mix? Um, hmm. that's a tough question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I think Ahilan's role was so. Uh, Tabla is known for its very versatile rhythmic vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm not wrong, um, or if Ahilan was here, he would probably say that it's probably the finest rhythmic uh, machine mm -hmm. uh, tabla. Um, so it can it can incorporate any kind of rhythm you give it to it mm -hmm. and uh, it has as I said it's also very versatile. Um, working with Ahilan and Tamar at the same time I don't think there is any kind of difficulties that we came across. The only only thing is that she her point of where she wanted highlighting some of the beats, mm. uh, he's probably not used to it from before. So that might have um, that might have enhanced actually his vocabulary or his understanding of uh, flamenco dance. Mm. And also sometimes I I don't know what the technical how to use the technical terms, 
Tamar would be able to say much better. But sometimes when she's singing, Ahilan has to do some other percussive work within it. But it's not necessarily he's used to from, say, being uh, working with me in, in katak, katak and tabla relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think it has, it has given him a much better understanding of how to accompany a flamenco dancer. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you as well, um, as you know, the performance was not only performed live um, mm -hmm. at 187 Augusta, it was also live streamed online and is now ho being hosted on an online exhibition. Did, did that, the format of the exhibition, shift the meaning of the work for you? And if so, um, I'm wondering how you think it may have. Um, what shifted the meaning? Um, or not. What was my interest was that so I saw it as as part of a journey of this project. So when we started with attachment detachment at EYA, I'm sorry, emerging young artists. Um, the idea was to showcase how within a multicultural society, when two cultures or multiple cultures meet, mm -hmm. where are those? There might be physical boundaries. Physical boundaries, not like a wall, but somehow physical boundaries um, compared to um, you know the boundaries uh, that can be blurred by uh, uh, internet as a tool that you have mentioned in your curatorial statement. So when we start, when we first created the project, it was trying to show uh, the similarities and the differences. Uh, and the tension that that gets created when different cultures meet in at one point, and do we need equilibrium um, or a balance uh, to make sure that there is no tension, or is it even necessary? So when we're trying to uh, create a balance between different cultures, do we wash away some of the identities of each individual cultures? Mm -hmm. So that was the starting point. Then when Project Forty approached us, the way I saw it is is the now we're talking about in the first step we talked about almost the physical boundaries between two cultures now is the internet going to blur or complicate those boundaries between the culture or is it going to make it more accessible to people who may not have come to see Katak uh, and Flamenco collaborations because it's Katak and Flamenco. Mm. Someone from, say, Japanese culture may not be interested in Katak and Flamenco, but mm. by having it broadcasted through a digital medium, is it, is it eliminating that boundary? Is that person now seeing us, okay, this is a performance on a concept and I'm going to enjoy that performance or try to understand without thinking too much it's Katak, Flamenco, India, Spain. Absolutely. Because I think something that your work does is like unearthing this history that mm -hmm. many people may not know about, which mm -hmm. is that Katak and Flamenco share mm -hmm. um, this route. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I think that inter and the fact that it's hosted on um, an online format kind mm -hmm. of works very nicely together mm -hmm. in that sense. So what I would be, so when I was um, working on it, so that's kind of the next phase mm -hmm. of, uh, that's how I saw, so it, it, it talked about the physical boundaries in the first, uh, first uh, evolution. Mm -hmm. The second evolution is that physical boundary getting blurred through internet. Mm -hmm. So the Project 40 Collective came in. Um, and how people have, um, if there's any feedback from people, how they have perceived that watching it through a social media. Um, I want to talk a little more about that really pivotal moment that you brought up in the performance where the fabric um, that separates both you and Tamar is uh, lifted and then later placed back down. And you spoke a little about it, a bit about it after the performance, um, explaining that the decision was kind of a back and forth one, mm -hmm. a difficult one to make. Um, how might that decision change if you were, if it were a longer production? Because you mentioned that you do want to expand it into something longer. Um, how would that storyline change in regards to the fabric um, and how it relates to your dance performance? Um, I think 
so it was a it was a decision made by me to um, to have that fabric because within the budget that's all we could do at that mm -hmm. point um, and it has um, it within that 12 minutes it has three different sections of it the first section is we showcased um, our culture separately and then we met so I, I recognized that there's another culture existing in almost in the same room and then we started fighting and then but then we became friends but then we put the fabric back and then we separated again so the idea was that even though we live in a multicultural society I'm not sure if we are fully welcoming of another culture. Um, it's still in my, I still question, do I totally embrace another culture? Do I totally um, uh, see another person as my, um, say if I'm from Bangladesh, um, if I see a Bangladesh person, the way I'll be welcoming that person, do I see do I have the same notion or do I have the same opening or welcoming nature towards another person or is it just a, uh, is it just a mask that mm -hmm. we're wearing on the face by saying, hey, we, we welcome everyone, mm -hmm. um, the culture should grow or are we going towards a, a, a different third, maybe a third reality mm -hmm. um, where uh, we don't identify ourselves as Indian or Bangladeshi or Spanish or Chinese Japanese, but we are Canadian. So the term Canadian, so it's it, to me, it's a it's a third reality. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so uh, if I want to expand it. Um, that especially that last segment a bit more, um, I would probably need to show a lot of confusion. Mm. Um, as I myself, um, I don't know when I'm saying myself as Canadian. Um, does it mean that I have to lose my identity or wash out my identity gradually and go towards a new reality? So I'm kind of still back and forth thing. Um, but if I need to expand it, there will be a lot of confused situations that will get created in that segment. Mm. We wanted to have a happy ending, mm. but I wasn't fully in favor of it because I feel that I'm not, that's not the reality. Absolutely. Like even when we go to, I studied at University of Toronto in school, Yes, I have friends from every corner of the world, but still there's somewhere, there is that separation, somewhere. So my question is, is that separation in that entire project, is that separation necessary for preserving our culture? Or do we make, uh, uh, do, do we try to create or force a balance where we wash out some of our identities? So. It's a very confusing situation. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, great. Thank you so much. I want to, um, I guess, end our chat uh, asking you if you have any upcoming projects or ideas that we can look forward to in the near sure. future. Mm -hmm. I recently started um, expanding an existing work. It's called Sunset in Fall. Yeah. Um, and it's based on Canadian fall season and um, the idea behind it was we presented a 10 minutes of it last year at a festival called Open 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 and it was curated by Emma B and uh, Cass, I, think. I don't remember her last name. Um, so, so that was presented but now we're expanding to a 30 minutes piece and it's very interesting if I tell you why I started talking about fall, as it's taken for granted. But someone with a South Asian background, fall is not a, a highlighted season in South Asia because we don't see the leaves turning, you know, yellow, orange, and all different palettes of colors. 
Um, the season that is very much highlighted in South Asia is monsoon. We, we get lots of rain and flood. Um, so fall to me every year is a very new experience and I'm just just so much in love with it. Mm -hmm. So I'm, for this expansion of this project, I'm collaborating with um, a Bharatanatyam dancer. So Bharatanatyam is a South Indian dance form. Mm -hmm. So her experience is the same. So from an immigrant um, uh, woman's perspective of fall, um, of course we are experiencing that, that color and beauty, but also at the same time the joy that fall brings to us from an immigrant woman, um, we, are, we are trying to create connection of that joy to our real life situations as well. I won't, I won't explore, like, you know, expose the whole story. Um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so this is an immig South Asian experience of fall season. Wonderful. And is this something that you're doing uh, through your work in the collective you created, the Katha Collective? Yes, okay. yes. So the Katha Collective, so I'm the sole, I, I mean, I'm a permanent member. Ahilan is, to some extent, uh, but the other people that I work with, they're all collaborators, so they come in and out of the projects. 